brother Eli, would you collect the Sunday school offering?
singers and musicians around the arch singing songs every single day. If you're in this group of singers or musicians, do you want to play the same song over and over and over, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year? No. Why? Because there are so many more exp um, exp emotions that we want to express and just the same thing and over and over. Not that there's anything wrong with singing the same song over and over and over. Sometimes we see a mighty move of God when we worship Him with the same song. And we can even have songs where the one simple word is the entire song with Amen and God will move. But David wanted to compile a songbook for the temple because his standing uh, choir or orchestra, whatever you want to call it, was in David's eyes to be permanent. And because of that, he was looking to compile a songbook. Now we've gone through that. And I'm not going to keep pulling and pulling and pulling. We all know that when we look at the book of Psalms, we see poetry, which is not uncommon because what are they? Psalms. And what make up songs? Poetic words. There are many poems that have been turned into songs just by having music added to them. Now, we've been looking at some of the big words throughout the book of Psalms, and we've been breaking it down to one or two a week. So we are going to go over them a little bit before we start jumping into today's uh, lesson. And if we go back, we looked at month later last week, so we'll look at um, Neg uh, Neganoth this week. It appears in Psalm chapter 4 and verse 1. Now when we're looking at a lot of these large words, keep in mind, they, they come from the heading of the chapter, where it might say, a song of David, uh, upon Gittith, to the chief musician. These are where we're pulling the large words from. Because if we're really going to understand something, we need to understand every aspect of it. We may not get a shouting experience when we start reading the genealogies, but when we start matching up names and genealogies and picking out those little pieces, that's when the genealogies get exciting because we know what we're looking at. So when we look at the top of Psalm chapter 4, and uh, verse 1, right there in the heading, the Bible reads, To the chief musician, or Neganot. In my Bible, I have in parentheses a string instrument. And then it concludes with a Psalm of David. So what is Neganot? I'm not even going to pronounce the Hebrew word it comes from because there's even a symbol in there. But it's more like Naganot. But according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it means instrumental music, by implication, a string instrument. By extension, a poem set to music. When we look at the Hebrew word, it occurs in 14 verses of the New Testament. In Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 14, if someone would please find that, Lamentations 3:14. If you ever some limitations, just stay there for a moment. I'll have to read one more verse. Limitations chapter 3, verse 14. Verse 14. I got it. Go ahead and read it. I was the derision to all my people and their song all the day. So the Hebrew word that was translated song in the KJV actually comes from the Hebrew word that we're talking about, Neganoth. And there it was translated song. Can you flip over to chapter 15, please, and read verse 14 as well? Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 5, I'm sorry. Lamentations 5. And if someone else would find Habakkuk 3.19. Habakkuk 3.19. What verse was that? Verse 14 in Lamentations 5. Okay. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men, from their music. And when we look at the word music there, that was the word that was translated from the Hebrew word. Now, if we would read over in Habakkuk chapter 3 and 19. And the phrase string instruments is with the translation from the Hebrew word. So when we look at the word neganoth, more than likely in this passage, 
It refers to the fact that it was meant to be played upon a string instrument of some sort. Now we'll look at one more before we continue on, and that is the word nehilah. And it occurs only one time in the entire Bible, and that is above the heading, in the heading of Psalm chapter 5 and verse 1, where it says, To the chief musician upon Negalah, or Nehalah, a song of David. So what is Nehalah? It's very similar to the word that we just talked about. But according to Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, it probably means a flute. And there's really no other um, definition given by Strong's. They simply conclude that it was a flute. If we look at the Hebrew word, that also only occurs one time in the entire Bible. Why is it important for us to know that? Because sometimes when a Hebrew word has been translated into the English, it's been used in several different ways. So if we're really going to understand the root of it, we study it out and not only look at how many times did the word, let's just use the word pray, uh, praise for example. We're not going to just look for the English word praise, but we're going to study it out in the verse that we're looking at, get the Hebrew word, and we're going to see how many times that was also used in the Bible, and how did the translators translate it into the English, because that gives us insight. Because sometimes we lose things in translations. But more than likely, this word nebulah actually refers to an instrument more than anything else. Now, if you remember when we started talking about the big words, uh, these odd words in the first places, a lot of the meanings have been lost to history. We don't really know. A lot of times it can refer, refer to an instrument. It could refer to the type of music it was supposed to be set to, maybe the tune. Maybe uh, a set of singers that were supposed to be used. We are just doing the best to our ability to properly understand it. But when we look at this word, it all indicates that it was pointed to indicating a musical instrument more than anything else. And this was the instrument upon which the song was to be played. If we would get Adam's Park Dictionary out, he claims that the instrument would have been hollow and been a wind instrument like a flute, trumpet, horn, or etc. However, when we start studying and studying out, practically everybody agrees that it was a flute of some sort. There are some that believe that this refers to the title of the song and not a musical instrument as well, at all. People like Scofield believe that this word is meant to be translated inheritance. In fact, if you have a date, and I don't know what your Bible looks like, but actually in my heading, right above there, right next to uh, net law, that date indicated that he believed it meant inheritance. And according to Spurgeon in the Treasury of David, even Ezra thinks it denotes some old and well-known melody for which the song was to be played. So that's the rundown on those two words. But like I said, when we look at Nehalah, practically everybody indicates that more likely, more than a title of the song, more than just a tune, it was actually the uh, flute that it was to be played upon. It was the instrument. Now we'll pick up next week when looking at the word praise in that passage, but if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 8, and the reason I say that is because I lied. That's the reason I said that. No, not really. I didn't just hit it. We're looking at Psalm 15. Psalm 8 was last week. So Psalm chapter 15. This is the psalm we're going to be looking at, so we might as well turn there and spend a little bit of time there. Psalm chapter 15. I will go ahead and read it. Because before we do a study on anything, really, we ought to read the chapter and then we dive into it. So Psalm chapter 15. For what it's worth, um, right in the heading it says, A Psalm on David, The Great Question of a Man, which is just a title of it. Verse 1. Lord, who 
Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contempt, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt, and changeth not. He that putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. As we get ready to study the psalm, what is one of the first things that we notice about the psalm that we're going to start to sit down and study for ourselves? What are some things that we might note on paper? What are some things that we're going to be looking for? It's one of David's songs. So to just reword that a little bit, one of the first things we're going to probably be questioning is, who wrote this song? And we would go to the thing, uh, books of the Bible, like Galatians, we know that Paul wrote it, so we don't have to do every single chapter. But when we look at the book of Psalms, it's different because each chapter was written by a different individual. Perhaps, because there were multiple, because each chapter is a song. So we're going to be looking at who wrote it. And who wrote it? Well, David. It is a song of David. What are some other things we might pull out as we study this passage? Or some things we might look for? Because the thing is, if you're like me, I will, I will take it down to the very last detail. If I'm going to study something, I will rip it apart and rip it to shreds. Because I want to know. So what are some things we might want to know about the book of, uh, about this song? Well, one of the more common things might be, well, how many verses are there to it? There are five verses to it. So it's not a long song, song at all. What might be some other things we want to look at? before we really dive in depth into this thing. Just basic stuff that we'd be looking for. Basically answer yes and no questions like who will, yeah. Yeah, who, what, when, where, why. Yeah. So we want to answer those questions. So we got, and we all answer those as we go along, but just starting to pull it apart, one of the next things we might want to figure out is what are some what are the key verses of this passage? What key verse, key verses? What are the verse or verses that just take this whole psalm and sum it up in a nutshell? Absolutely. You want to go ahead and read that for us? He that walketh uprightly and works righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Absolutely. I would agree with that wholeheartedly, verse 2. Now when it comes to trying to find out the key words, key verses, that kind of stuff, there's really no right or wrong answer. It's just us, for our own personal study, trying to train our mind and look at it. What is the main gist of this? If we had to narrow it, narrow it down to a few words or a phrase, what is it going to consist of? I actually included verse 1 along with that. And the reason for that being is, not that verse 2 doesn't nail it on the head, but the reason I included verse 1 in my key verses, because there's a question being posed. And to me, it's an extremely important question, because it's a question that's been posed several times throughout the book of Psalms, especially in the Psalms of David. And that is, uh, who shall abide in thy tabernacle, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? I mean, for anyone who's been in the Word of God long enough, who's read the book of Psalms several times, that is something that should just pop right out of us because it is included in one of the, what I consider one of the main Psalms in the first place. And for us as Christians, is that not the answer the question that all of us are asking in our life? Am I worthy to stand before a holy God? Jonathan Edwards preached that famous psalm, uh, sermon 
that they claim sparked the Reformation, or the Great Awakening, I'm sorry, Great Awakening. Reformation was many months before him. But sinners in the hands of an angry God. You know, for us, are we holy to stand before a holy God because we know that day is approaching and that life is short? So that is the ultimate question of life. Not of, will I make it through today or how will I survive, but am I able to stand on the holy will of God? And then in verse 2 we have the response. The right for the righteous man. Now, if we would look at this passage, what do you think might be some key words that would sum up this passage in a nutshell? Get away from phrases and just words. What are some words that might pop out to describe this? Because when we do a, a Bible study, we start out broad. We look at what is the general statement that this chapter is saying. So within that, we are looking for the key verses. What verses sum this up? And then we break it down smaller and smaller and smaller. It's easy for somebody to get up and give an hour sermon, but if they had to chop that down into two minutes, that can be hard because they have to get rid of a lot of stuff. So this is what we're trying to do. We're looking at the, our Bible study and we're trying to get smaller bites, smaller bites, smaller bites. Just break it down as far as we can go. So when we look at Psalm chapter 15, what might be a word or some words that would describe it in a nutshell? Not that. Not that. How about we did this? Walk. Because when we look at backbiting, that's a person's walk. That's how they respond. So, and when we look throughout this uh, song, we find the word walketh appears at least once. What might be something else? What's that? That's kind of what works. But if we had to sum this up, so we have walketh, does it talk anything about else about an individual, what they might respond? What's that? Neighbors. Not neighbors. But how about these three? How about walketh? Because we're dealing with the walk of the person. How about worketh? Because we're dealing with its actions and responses. And then finally speaketh, because we are talking about his tongue as well. In verses 2 and 3, we are dealing with the human tongue. And I'll go ahead and read these. He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness, and speaketh the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not, or doesn't gossip, with his tongue, nor doeth evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor. So we're dealing with the human tongue. Then we're dealing with his works, or his part, in verse 4, where the Bible states, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, but he honoreth them that fear the Lord, he that sweareth to his own hurt, and changes not. So we're dealing with his part. And then finally, we are hit, talking about where it counts most to some people. 
where it's hard to get something from their cold, dead hands even if they wanted to, or if we tried. And that is we're dealing with their finances. We're dealing with their wallet in verse 5, where the Bible states, He putteth not out his money to usury, nor taketh reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. So, stealing the words of Spurgeon because all he did was alliterate what I spoke earlier for the key words. We are dealing, this psalm deals with a person's walk, his work, and his word. When we look at this uh, psalm to begin with, it's actually a, a responsory psalm. If we go back to the Pentateuch, and the reason, reason I say that is I can't remember which book it is, but we'll find that the children of Israel are divided into two different groups on mountainsides as they're reciting the law of the Lord. And what they'll do is one person on one map, uh, one set, one group of people on one map would put out the first phrase, and the second group on the other far mountain on the other side of the valley would respond for the other half. So you have the word of the Lord echoing throughout the valley. What was it? It was a response area type uh, statement in the book of Deuteronomy or uh, situation or work that they were doing. And when we look at the book of Psalms, chapter 15, that's what we're dealing with. What's the first one? It's a question. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? That is the question. And in verses 2 through 5, we have the response. So it's a question and answer type psalm. If we would try to study the history of the psalm, well, as we were saying earlier, who, what, why, when, and where, we might try to date the psalm. And if we were to try to date it, we know that it could not come before the Jews left uh, Egypt way back in the book of Exodus or before the Exodus because the very first verse deals with the tabernacle of God. And what is the tabernacle of God? Well, it's literally the tabernacle in the wilderness because the tabernacle was a shadow of things in heaven. It was a type. As much as Sister Beth loves to study types, and I'm being sarcastic, the tabernacle in the wilderness shows us and gives us a glimpse into the throne room of God and who He is. So, we know that that did not come about until they were in the wilderness, so this psalm was written after the wilderness. And we know who wrote it, so obviously it came much later. When you start studying, trying, trying to study out the psalms, you'll see different commentators try to put it to, well, this psalm was written between uh, Malachi and Matthew, or it was written during the Maccabean era, or it was written during the Babylonian era. Well, what we know about the headings on the psalms were they were added at a later date by somebody who claimed that this was written by this individual. Probably one of the editors in the book of Psalms to begin with. And the insight that they gave us was that David wrote the psalm. In fact, I thought it was interesting that Spurgeon actually, when you look at the background, he claims that he, since it deals with the tabernacle, that it's very possible that David wrote this prior to or after in a response to the Ark of the Covenant coming out of the house of Obadidim and being brought back to Jerusalem. Now when we look at Christ in this psalm itself, according to Keith L. Brooks, Christ is seen as a spotless lamb that is majesty, reigning on high to those who submit themselves to him. Until we conform ourselves to the image of Christ, there is no place for us with him in heavenly places. When we look at this passage here, we don't have to go far to find Christ in the passage because it's dealing with who's going to be able to stand on the holy hill. And we know that the throne of God is on Christ is on that holy hill. And we'll study that out, I think, a little bit later. If not, I will bring it out. But if you look at the poetic form of this, it would be responsory parallelism, where 
members are in my photo or appear and answer alternator, um, alternately is what I would believe. And that example is taken from Psalm 115, 9 through 11, and also 107, 1 and 2. It's where something is stated and then responded to. Where we have something stated in Psalm 1, who can stand and dwell in the holy hill, and then 2 through 5 are the answers to that. When we look at this psalm in general, the essence of the psalm all buckles around and hinges on this question. Who can stand on the holy hill of God? Those who are perfect and upright before the Lord. Now let me ask you this. Is this the only time that this question has appeared in the book of Psalms? Or does appear, I should say. Who shall stand in the hill of the Lord? There's another one. Does anybody want to take a stab at what chapter? I know now I'm pulling out the narrow or something I didn't cover yet. It's part of the three main psalms. Let me back up. It's part of three main psalms that discuss the offices of Jesus Christ. Prophet, priest, and king. Psalm chapter 22 describes Christ as the suffering servant. Him in his office as prophet. Because it describes crucifixion to the teeth. It was written 500 years before crucifixion was ever invented, and yet we have a perfect description of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Then we have Christ as priest in Psalm chapter 23, where he's portrayed as the good shepherd. But in Psalm chapter 24, it is still a prophetic passage because it is one that has not come back, come to pass yet. And that is, it describes the kingship or the office of king that Jesus Christ will hold. And in that passage, we deal with, lift up ye heads, O ye gates, speaking of the gates of Jerusalem, the literal gates of Jerusalem. But also within that passage, we have, who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Psalm 24 gives us the response, he that has clean hands and a pure heart. But we're going to look at that into it in a little bit more detail here. Because what is the holy hill of God? Because it is extremely important for us. Because if we're going to stand there, and if that's the main question, we need to know where we're going to be standing. What is this holy hill? The holy hill of God is the place where God himself resides. If someone would please find Ezekiel 28 and verse 14. Ezekiel 28 and 14. And you have copies of all the verses there. We're not going to read them all. But Ezekiel 28 and verse 14. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have said thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God, thou hast walked up and down the midst of the stone of fire. So who is being discussed in this passage? Lucifer, the devil. And where does it say he was? It's not hard. We've just been talking about it. The holy mountain of God. And he was walking up and down the stones of it. He was the anointed cherub that covered him. And he decided to set his throne above God's. But he was on the holy hill. So the holy hill is where God's throne is. It's where he himself resides. Psalm chapter 3 and verse 4 states, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. What is the holy hill? It is the place where God's throne is. It is where he resides. It is a place that is described as holy. It is special. What do we know about Moses when God appeared unto him on the bush? What did, he, what did the voice say unto Moses before he approached? Okay. And what else did he tell the brother? I 
and your mom is her dad, and if your mom's very particular about her floors in her house, she's going to tell you about doing something before she, you enter the rest of it. Take off, shoes. take off your shoes. And why did God tell Moses to take off his shoes? He was standing on holy ground. When we deal with the holy hill of God, it is precious, it is special. Nothing can be there that defiles it in any way. It is kept with the utmost care. And it is a place where even angels are careful with how they pre present themselves. What does Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 to 3 state? Isaiah 6, 2 to 3. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 2 and 3. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another, and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And we step back to verse 1. We are looking at the throne room of God, where the train of Jesus Christ built the temple. And the angels that are there in their presence are not there just standing guard, but the seraphims know that they are in the presence of a holy God. They state it three times. Some state that the fact that it was uttered three times is a reference of holy is the Father, holy is the Son, holy is the Holy Ghost. But we find that these angels did something very particular. They knew that they were in the presence of a holy God. This holy God that told Moses, take off your shoes for you are on holy ground. And because of that, they covered their face because they were not worthy enough to see and have the God himself behold their face. They covered their hands. They covered their feet. Why? Because they were in the presence of a holy God. The question here is, who shall us, I should say, say who shall us, I, was getting, I love Psalms 24, so let me go back and read Psalm 15. The question is, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? The tabernacle on earth was a symbol and a shadow of things in heaven. And who shall dwell in thy holy hell? Who shall, and who is the one that is able to dwell in the holy hell of God? Those that are claimed by the blood, but to put in the word of Psalm, the righteous. The righteous are the ones who are the who are able to stand in the presence of God. When we look at this psalm, we can actually see it exemplified in Hebrews 11, 9, and 10, the life of Abraham. I'm running out of time, so we don't have to go flip it all over. But you do have the verses, so you can see where I'm coming from. But we're looking at a soldier, somebody who is traveling, not somebody who is set in this world, but somebody who is traveling on, who's looking for, the, as Abraham was, a city whose builder and maker was God. They're not looking at these earthly things, but they are heavenly minded, and their gaze is constantly upward. They are looking at their walk, they are looking at their work, and we are looking at their word. When we look at the right walk of the, uh, of the righteous, we know that according to verse 2 of Psalm chapter 8 is that their walk is upright. They are walking perfectly with God. They are in stand up uh, in a stand-up position with the community, with their fellow brothers, with their neighbors, even those that would try to bring harm to them and put them down. They look upon them even within themselves and know that they are right and that they are just. The person who is able to stand in the holy hill of God is the righteous. They are walked uprightly. And we know that God preserves the righteous unless they pervert their walk, according to Psalm 125 and verse 3. But the when it comes to the walk of the righteous, they have only good desires. They don't need to do harm to another individual, but they have only good desires toward one of, towards their fellow man. And they keep them in their, in their hearts. But the other thing, too, is 
They do not defile their minds. They make sure that their minds are pure. They are, to put it in today's vernacular or even our Christian walk, they keep their mind constantly on the word of God because upon that word do I meditate day and night. They attempt to hide the word of God in their heart that their minds might not be defiled by this world system. Because just back then, I'm sure just like today, they were bombarded with all the things of this world. And today it might even be easier. You don't have to go into but Walmart or lawyers maybe to hear perverted things come across the radio, songs that are displeasing to God. But the righteous keep their mind in the midst of it all, pure and holy before God. When it comes to their work, they keep a good reputation with their fellow man. Why do they keep a good reputation? Because they know deep down that they are ambassadors of Jesus Christ. They are representatives of the kingdom of heaven. They don't want to bring a reproach to God. And because of that, they make sure that they, their work ethic is good. They make sure that their actions are good. That they have a good reputation. That they are known for being honest. They help others without looking for anything in return. Or looking to take advantage of them. I know one person one time that offered his truck search to be serviced to help somebody else move. And at the end of the day, he said, I'll only charge you 20 bucks for today. The righteous do things without looking for things in return. They do them out of the goodness of their own heart. Why is that? Because in doing so, they reveal the very nature and the character of whom they are representing, and that is Jesus Christ. When we look at the word uh, for usury, there in verse 5, and I'll just go ahead and read that. He that putteth not out his money to usury actually means to bite like a serpent. They don't do things only to sink their teeth and to get something greater or do to backstab somebody and just drain them of their wealth or their time or whatever they'd be looking for. But they do it out of the goodness of their own heart. They don't do it to take advantage of them of those in distress, but rather they are looking to uplift those that need help. And then finally, when we look at the word of the righteous, according to verse 2 of Psalm chapter 15, they speak truth. They are truthful. In Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 5, we know that the righteous, they hate lying. There is no gossip in their tongue, according to verse 3 of Psalm 15. And when we look at gossip, it literally means in the Hebrew to strip bare of their garments. So with the righteous, they don't gossip about others. They don't mean to take away from them. They don't want to do them harm. They don't want to strip them bare and for the public eye to see. They want to uplift. So they watch their words. They don't gossip. They don't speak evil. They don't speak ill. But rather, out of their mouth, according to Psalm 37, verse 30, the righteous speak wisdom. And according to Proverbs 2 and verse 7, that the wisdom of the righteous is sound, is not polluted in any way. When we look at, I think it's 2 Timothy, the Bible is talked about a science falsely so called when it comes to the science of this world. Why? Because they polluted it to make it say what they wanted to say. They wanted to have something other than God, so they made their science say whatever they want. But the righteous do not do that with their words. When it comes to their wisdom, it's not polluted. God, they've not done evil on the side of the Lord. They don't have a reprobate mind, so God didn't give them over to idols or their own way. But rather, their wisdom is sound because it is the wisdom of God. And not just that, but according to Proverbs chapter 15 and 28, the righteous study to make sure that they are giving sound advice and sound wisdom. Their knowledge that they have is sound because they didn't go down. Ever see the game of telephone when you were younger or growing up, maybe? You tell one person something in their ear and it goes down the chain, and by the time you get to the end, it is completely changed. The words of the righteous are wise and unpolluted because they study to make sure that the facts are accurate, their words are right. They don't want to lead anybody astray. And because of that, their wisdom is sound. And their words are life. Does anybody have anything that they want to add at this point? And if not, who shall send in the hill of the Lord? Isn't there who? a person in the Bible that says, uh, Isaiah, Solomon? 
What's that, brother? A verse that speaks, it says what? Oh, Shiloh, there is, but that's actually referring to Jesus Christ's second return. Yeah, that's what I think. But who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Who has the right to dwell in the tabernacle of God or stand on his holy hill? Only the righteous. Those that watch the walk, watch the words, and watch the work, that it may all be pleasing to God. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory because you are God who reigns from high and there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke any attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property above and below, and no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset and one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth. That the Holy Ghost may move as He so desires, Lord. Lord, I pray you right now, Lord, for the song leader and the musicians. Give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords, Lord. As they lead us in the song, as you have us to sing. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips, Lord, as he brings forth your word. Give him a special blessing. And may our hearts and our minds be plowed, that they be good soil, Lord. That we may remember your word, Lord. But even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives. That we would be transformed into your very image, Lord. That we may be the righteous man who is able to stand on the hill in the hill of the Lord. That we may be able to stand before you in good conscience. Knowing on that day, Lord, that we will not hear those words, depart from me. And we will not have to say, Lord, have we not done this and try to make excuses. But may our walk be right. May our words be right. And may our actions be right, Lord. May they be pleasing to you because we are your ambassadors. Just change us and transform us like never before. May our minds be stayed on you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.